Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com bringing you insights from the world's best macro minds. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. We are here with you today to discuss investor behavior in markets and outlook for the U.S. economy for the second half of the year. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channels for more in-depth interviews that will help keep you up with the latest investment news. Today, we are here with Phil McIntosh, Chief Economist at NASDAQ. Phil, welcome to Public. Thanks for having me. So we have a lot to talk about today, but I wanted to first ask you, now that markets are six months into 2023 and NASDAQ is providing a near 30% return over that time frame, could you provide some insight into the top retail investor trends, the general sentiment activity throughout that period, as well as what you think might happen going forward? Yes, I guess the first place we should start is talking about the 30% return in the NASDAQ. And if you look at what's going on, I mean, obviously last year, every time interest rates went up, the stock market went down. Once we got to the end of last year, you started to see inflation starting to fall here and in Europe. And so investors could pretty clearly see the Fed was going to have an excuse to pause or slow down their rate hikes. And as that happened, it removed a a sort of headwind from the stock markets. And so this year's rally has really been about people resetting their expectations for how high interest rates we're going to get, the fact that they're slowing down and maybe going to stop. And so what you've seen in terms of the return to the market, the uh, the NASDAQ has done a lot better than the S&P 500, and the S&P 500 has done even better than the Dow. And so what really has happened is the growth stocks have recovered a lot of the underperformance they had during last year. And that makes sense because when you're buying a growth stock, you're buying income not for this year. It's not a dividend yield now, potentially. It's a dividend in five years or 10 years. And so if you've got to pay a whole lot of interest in between now and then, the profits are actually going to be lower after all that. So if interest rates come down, it reduces expenses for companies, makes those profits worth more in the future. So that's kind of what's happened in the stock market, why the stock market has gone up and the why we've seen a lot of the growth companies outperform. In terms of what we've seen retail doing, um, it's been really interesting because retail was pretty negative last year as the market went down on stocks. Um, they sold a lot of the tech stocks, which are obviously the sector that got really harmed by the the interest rate effects on the growthiness of them. This year has been a little weird because as the market's recovered, we've actually seen lots of months where retail was still selling tech, still selling pretty much broadly across the market. Uh, It's only really been the last two months we've seen retail come back. uh, And a lot of that retail buying was actually looking at Tesla um, as it kind of bounced off its lows and recovered. We saw a lot of people looking at Tesla, hitting the offer on that stock uh, and sort of participating in its rally um, as it sort of recovered up to where it is right now. Yeah, and NVIDIA has been a really big, exciting stock too. Have you seen a lot of hype on your end around that? And has that sort of gained a lot of traction? I mean, it's definitely been in the news. It's definitely had great returns. Um, And obviously the story with NVIDIA is with artificial intelligence and chat GPT kind of proving itself really quickly and and what it can do and the capabilities of it, um, people have sort of looked at all the different places that might benefit from artificial intelligence. And obviously, if you're going to train models on lots of data, you need really good chips. And so NVIDIA always benefits when that's a thematic. So NVIDIA has done great. It's become one of the biggest stocks in America in a really short period of time. Uh, And so it's been interesting to look at. But from a retail flow perspective, we haven't seen the same kind of buying as we did in Tesla a, a month or so ago. So people are really, really focused on Tesla. Do you think that's the Elon Musk effect or what do you think is causing that? Maybe Tesla is a little bit more tangible because people can own Tesla cars and and know what the product is that they're buying. Um, We definitely see when we look at retail trading, retail tend to trade much more actively in stocks that have brands that we know, whether that's American Airlines, United Airlines, Amazon, Apple, like all those kinds of brands, Meta, which is Facebook, Google, like those stocks have lots of retail interest. They're not all tech stocks, but they're stocks with really solid retail brands. So I think it helps for retail investors. And it's probably a good thing to know a bit about the company that you're buying. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably good to to know. I feel like some people go in and and maybe don't know exactly what they're buying when they buy stuff. Yeah. So you wrote the 2023 Intern's Guide to the Market Structure Galaxy. Can you walk us through that refresher as we're talking about stocks, as we're talking about Tesla? Um, Just a quick guide. Yeah. Yeah, so we do this every year when um, a lot of the trade desks, which are obviously our customers, have their interns on the desk because markets are a bit complicated and people probably don't realize that Apple, even though it's listed on the NASDAQ, can trade in 16 different exchanges. It can trade in 30 plus dart pools. Even how do you trade? Like what's a bid? What's an offer? How do you build an algo, which is what happens for a lot of 
mutual fund orders that slices a hundred thousand share order into tiny little pieces so that no one can really tell what you're doing so you can minimize your market impact um, so we basically summarize how the market works and it's a bit complicated so we try and make it as simple as possible um, and basically we go through all those sorts of things you know a bid is obviously the price that somebody wants to buy at an offer is the price that someone wants to sell at um, there's a computer that basically goes out to all 16 exchanges and works out which exchange has the best bid and the best offer and sends that out to all of us on our price feeds so we know what the best price is across all 16 exchanges when we hit the buy button um, and, and then you just got to think about it like do i want to pay the offer and trade right now or do i want to sit on the bid and try and save a little bit of money maybe i might not get traded maybe somebody will see me on the bid and the market will move up on me and i won't ever get that trade done Maybe I'll end up paying even more than the offer by the time I get done. And that's a real world problem for algo builders to solve for institutional traders as well. Yeah. With all that, I'm just curious, you know, with all of that being said, like we have all of these mechanical things that go into actually making markets. Do you feel like the efficient market hypothesis, the idea that consumers are responding to all information that they have, everything's completely efficient. Do you feel like that holds up in current market structure? I think pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think you would, if you talk to a mutual fund trader, they probably argue it's a bit too efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that, like obviously the efficient market is if all information, maybe not the private information part, but all like you post a bid and the market sees that there's a buyer there and then the market reacts to that. And you actually do see that happen. So that's why we've developed things like hidden order types so that a large buyer can rest at the midpoint or maybe even rest at the bid, but not show that they're a buyer for a thousand shares because that would make the bid look twice as big as it is and everyone would see that. So the market is uh, very data driven. There's a lot of signals just from what's happening on the tape, which is the where all the trades get printed, what's happening on the screen. Um, and, and a lot of that stuff gets built into people's models in terms of whether the market's buy or sell and what they should do. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because we have the economy and then we have the stock market, right? And like the two things are very different. Um, and a lot of what has been driving, it seems like retail investors to a certain extent, is recession fears. So like people, as you mentioned, have pulled back from buying stocks. Um, how do you sort of like tie together the economy and the stock market and um, those two things that can be very, very different? Yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, they're related. But what we see when we look at the economic data is historical data about what's happened. What you're doing when you're buying a stock is you're buying the future earnings of that mm -hmm. stock. So you might buy Tesla 10 years ago when it's not profitable, knowing that it's going to have you know some really big increases in demand and in manufacturing. It's going to have a battery technology that everyone's going to want to plug into and a charging technology that everyone's going to want to plug into. And so what you're doing there is you're buying the future earnings of that company. Even what's happened this year, the interest rates have actually kept going up in terms of the Fed short term rates, but the market's thinking they're not going up as fast. That's a good thing for stocks because in the future, three, five, 10 years from now, interest rates won't be at 8%, which I was worried about. They might even be lower than 5%, and that's much better for stocks, and it's much better for companies with a lot of interest to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a lot of companies, right? Like a lot of companies have hit up the debt markets recently, it seems. Um, and that's a, so going back to that point around, you know, interest rates could lower in the future. It seems like everybody thinks that we're going to be skirting this recession that everyone was kind of predicting. Um, so how do you tie in your outlook to the U.S. economy to stocks right now? Do you think that everybody is getting more optimistic about things moving forward? Yes, I guess there's the headwinds have kind of been taken away. So the interest rates aren't rising as fast. That headwind has gone away. Earnings have actually been negative for the last two quarters, and we're expected this quarter, which we just started, to see a third quarter of negative earnings. So actually, earnings are making stocks look cheap right now because the earnings are going down and the prices are staying flat. But the expectation is we will actually start to see earnings recover coming into Q4, into next year. Um, and so the market's obviously looking forward. They're not looking right now. But when I talk to companies, in terms of the economics that they see, I mean, the Fed is looking at inflation, which is still pretty strong, even at a core level. And they're looking at unemployment, which is still really strong. There's lots of jobs per worker. Um, spending is really strong. We still saw that today. So that the, the Fed thinks the economy is really strong, but corporates don't. And so that's more reflective of the corporates are making losses the last couple of quarters. They're, well, not losses, but their, their income is down versus where it was a year ago. So they're struggling to keep their margins up. Their costs are rising. Their revenues aren't rising fast enough. Um, so corporates are struggling. We've seen uh, the hours for temp working going down. We've seen peak 
um, in terms of manufacturing activity years ago, we've seen a lot of the PMIs, the indexes, which are surveys of manufacturing um, companies being negative for close to a year now. So we're expecting a contraction in manufacturing. We're maybe expecting services to hold the economy up, but it's, it's so been slowing down in terms of its rate of growth as well. So companies don't feel nearly as bullish as the Fed probably feels because they're focused on different data points. Hmm. And do you think that, I mean, I feel like the answer might be obvious here, but do you feel like that's problematic that the Fed is looking at different things than what corporations are looking at? There was a research paper that said it'd make more sense for the Fed to look at earnings calls versus trying to look at all these different economic data points. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the risk that the Fed has what we call a policy error is what the market has worried about. It's what the market was worried about sort of in January when the Fed kept talking really tough, even though we'd already seen some of this soft data slow. I think what's changed is we're now six months on from there and the soft data hasn't really translated into hard data slowing. And so that's why a lot of economists now are actually starting to your point, revise their forecasts and go, you know what, maybe the amount of money we saved during COVID is enough to hold people through and the slowdown is just gonna slow, not turn into like a self-fulfilling contraction, which would turn us into a recession. And a lot of the forecasters are, have been pushing recession out to later and later into 24, maybe even later. Now they're starting to say, perhaps we have enough jobs out there that we could see the employment market slow a little bit without creating unemployment, which would create that kind of cycle where people worry about their job security, spend less because of that, which means companies earn less, which means they lay more people off, which means you have even more worry. You kind of get a little bit of a cyclical effect there where it feeds on itself, and that's when you can have a recession. So I think we've just we've been so long now expecting that soft data, which was weak, to filter through into the real data and it hasn't. And I, I mean, we haven't had COVID before and yeah. obviously we're learning every step of the way, just how much people saved, um, how much that stimulus helped people get their balance sheets in order. And um, the consumer still seems pretty confident. Yeah, yeah, they do. Retail sales did dip down a little bit. So 0.2% growth versus estimates of 0.5%. So, you know, what are your thoughts on maybe not the retail data specifically, but just the strength of of the consumer moving forward and how that'll impact corporations and stocks. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the retail spending has shifted from goods to into services pretty much as the vaccines rolled out. So we've sort of seen that trend play out. I think that's partly why the manufacturing sector has been so weak. Um, when you talk to companies, you definitely see like differences of, of opinion, like a two speed economy. Manufacturing is quite weak. Um, a lot of the housing sector is quite weak, but ironically, because interest rates are so high now and a lot of people locked in mortgage rates really low we're seeing no one wants to sell a real house but because of that there's no real houses for sale people are having to buy new houses so new houses are actually doing pretty well which means all the white goods and all of the, the long-term durables are going okay because you've got to put them into all the new houses as well i mean it's it's a really interesting economy as we kind of still work through the recovery phase of COVID, and now we're dealing obviously with interest rates that are um, way higher than mortgage rates for a lot of people. And so that's changing people's behavior just in terms of, you know, do I Airbnb and keep my real house? Um, or, or, you know, do I, how, how can I move jobs and move states? I don't want to sell the house that's got a good mortgage on it. Yeah, a lot of golden handcuffs out there for sure. But in terms of the uh, houses, not jobs. But um, yeah, it seems like a lot of people, it, it almost works against what the Fed is trying to do, right? Because so many people are locked in. Uh, the Fed's toolkit doesn't work quite as well. Yeah, there's definitely a point where, which is probably a good thing for the consumer, right? Because we go back to 2007, what happened back then when interest rates started to rise was a lot of a lot of people had three and five year arms, which are resettable mortgages. So mm -hmm. that fixed rate that you locked in to start the, the mortgage flipped into a variable rate. And so you didn't realize how much higher that variable rate could be. Mortgage, The mortgage costs right now have doubled for someone that wants to start a new mortgage. But what happened in 2007 was Mortgage costs doubled for a lot of people that had their house existing. And so suddenly their mortgage costs went up whether they liked it or not. Oh, and wow. that kind of caused the credit crisis because it caused this problem where people couldn't afford to pay their mortgages anymore. And so they put their houses on the market. No one wanted to buy them because mortgage rates had gone up. And so the prices went down. And then eventually it was better off to hand your keys back to the bank. And so the banks had a lot of losses on mortgages. It's like this time around, we don't have that kind of pressure, which is good. We have a lot of fixed mortgages, so the, the household sector looks reasonably secure from a balance sheet perspective. But as we saw in sort of March, there's been some problems from banks trying to hedge the interest rate risk. Yeah. Now it's their risk. 
Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And uh, maybe not not best practices implemented in the time of zero, you know, zero interest rate policy has made some people a little lazy, it seems. Well, I guess nobody expected the interest rates to go as high as they ended up going because everyone Absolutely. thought the inflation wasn't going to get as out of control as it did. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly when you realize, hey, I could earn 5% on a deposit, why don't I pull my money out and put it in a 5% account? Um, and so that's when you get the deposit flight and with social media and news cycles being so fast these days, it was pretty quick when the deposit started to move. So, you know, it, it created its own, I mean, bank runs are not a new thing, but it, it created that kind of a liquidity problem where an asset that was well hedged, long-term liability, long-term asset, everybody thought you'd have your mortgage forever and your deposits would be fairly sticky. Suddenly the deposits moved to a different bank. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you probably couldn't have forecast all of that happening at once, yeah. um, especially a year before when everybody, when you look at the curve, the interest rate curve always underestimated where the inflation would get and where the Fed would need to get to as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And everything has moved so quickly, as you said, and so viciously also. Um, so this would be the last question, but you know, we talked a lot about economic risk and market risk and all that stuff. And so just to summarize, what do you think the biggest, and this is a big question, but what do you think the biggest risk of the economy is moving forward? That is a good question. Um, I mean, I guess we're priced a little bit for a soft landing right now. Um, you've got costs rising because of all the inflation that we've had for companies, although some of the indexes for the input price inflation have now gone flat to negative. At the same time, you've got like inventories are fixed, so margins are coming down. A lot of people are talking about this earnings cycle being a margin compression problem. So we could actually see earnings having, a, I guess, a bigger struggle to recover um, than the forecasts have. But maybe the bigger thing is, you know, barring some geopolitical risk, um, I don't think interest rates are going to get back down to one or two percent. Like, I don't think we're going to see zero interest rates again in the short term. And so that means that getting back to peak equity valuations is going to take maybe a bit longer than people thought as well. Because when you think about the discounts, the, the growth stock effect that we talked about earlier, the PE of the market is actually driven a lot by the underlying 10 year interest rate or very long term interest rate. It makes sense. It's what companies finance with. It's what you're meant to compete with when you're looking at equity returns. And so if interest rates are only going to come down one or two percent, we're not going to get back quickly to the, the peaks that we had before COVID in terms of pricing. Yeah, it seems like it's just a wait and see sort of problem that we have on our hands. A little bit, and partly because of that, you can look at the volatility in the US market. The VIX index is actually really low, mm -hmm. um, which ironically we did see just before the credit crisis as well. The interest rate volatility is high, the market volatility is low, because to your point, on stocks we're kind of waiting and seeing, like will interest rates peak at 5.25, 5.5, will they come down next year or not? The bond market obviously cares about that because they're betting on interest rates, but we're waiting to see what that does to 10 year rates and what that does to stock valuation. So. Mm -hmm. You, you kind of got relatively like long-term expectations playing a bit of wait and see in the stock yeah. market right now. Yeah. Well, I guess that's all we can do. Well, thank you, Phil. This has been a wonderful conversation. Where can people find your work? Uh, if you Google me and NASDAQ.com, <laughs> you'll see the uh, intern's there. guide and the library and the sign up you can do for all of our, uh, our analysis. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thanks for having me.